Thank you again for coming to the last session. We're going to, I hope, have an open discussion. And I want to talk about what we're going to do, and what we're going to try to do, what I hope will happen. Um, I'll give you a little background about me, and, and I'll, I'll let our, our panelists introduce themselves. My name is Sam McMaster. Um, I wear a couple different hats. I'll tell you about two of them. I'm the chief clinical officer for a, a treatment program called Journey Pure. And we have residential programs and five sites and some outpatient programs. We do not do medication-assisted therapies in those sites. Um, in a couple sites, we work with people who are receiving medication-assisted therapies other places, but we consciously have chosen not to do that. Um, another hat that I wear is I'm a professor at Baylor um, in Houston, and we're at I've done research for about the last 20 years around addiction, and I've worked on a lot of projects related to medication-assisted therapies. And I've seen people's lives be transformed and changed by those therapies. Um, so I'm very aware of the strengths of those. And then lastly, I'm a person in recovery. I've been clean and sober for 27 years, and I'm a... But thank you. Um, and I'm really uncomfortable having this conversation, and I'm really uncomfortable having this conversation because I have a lot of uncomfortable conversations about medication-assisted therapy all over the place in lots of different ways. Um, most of my best thoughts happen in the shower. I don't know if anybody else has that experience. <laughs> I certainly do. I was taking a shower the other day, and I was really quite frustrated that this is the session that I got. It was, hey, thank you so much for inviting me. You're asking me to do what? Um, why? That seems really uncomfortable. And I realized, while well, I was taking a shower, I was thinking back, I'm actually the beneficiary of medication assisted therapy. When I came out of treatment at 19, I went and lived at the beach, and they put me on a drug called Anabuse. Have you ever heard of Anabuse? Anybody know what Anabuse is? I don't think I, I can get it in. Okay. So it's a drug that you can take and you would get physically sick if you drank. And every day I would take a pill and I wouldn't drink. And it was my way of kind of going, saying so over today. And uh, I lived in a supported environment at the time. And, um, and it worked. And after a while I stopped taking it. Anybody ever been to Ocean City, Maryland? Yep. That's where I live. Anybody know anything about the French fries in Ocean City, Maryland? Thrashers. Thrashers French fries. What do they put all over there? Thrashers French fries. Oh, Secrets. Secrets. Vinegar is the secret. And vinegar looks just like alcohol chemically to your body. So every time I eat Thrasher's French fries, I'd, I'd start to feel sick. And I'd stop taking Anabuse abuse because I like French fries. <laughs> <laughs> but Anabuse bought me enough time that I was able to get to some meetings and I was able to, to stay sober, even despite my French fry addiction. So, <laughs> what we're going to try to do is talk about medication-assisted therapy. I think it's a conversation we need to have. Um, we were talking before about Hazleton and Benny Ford, which are kind of the two flagships of treatment, recently combined and recently started to do medication-assisted therapy in treatment. The ASAM, anybody know what ASAM stands for? American Society of Addiction you get all the right answers. Okay, so it, that's what it, the American Society of Addiction Medicine came out last week and said 70% of treatment centers do not do medication-assisted therapy. 30% do in some degree, and we need to change that. And we want all treatment centers to provide medication-assisted therapy because the research is there. I had an initial gut reaction to that. Okay. Um, we're going to talk more about that, and I'm sure some of you guys have had some of those same experiences. I want to um, introduce our panelists, Mark, Kay, Kenny, and Eliza are going to talk about their experiences briefly <coughs> with medication-assisted therapy, and then I want us to open up and have a discussion. And I want to remember a couple of principles. One is nobody has the right to, to be wrong about their information, but they do have the right to what? Their opinion. Right. Um, I want to make sure that we don't take away anybody's experience, but that we all have our own experience. And I want this to be a very positive experience. Um, and I want to have a, a, a discussion about this because I think it's important and I think it's, things are going to change whether we want to be part of that change or not. So, who wants to go first? Well, none of us want to go first. Right, who's willing to go first? <laughs> 
Do I need that thing, Scott? No, you can just turn your mic off. It's an on button. It's O N. <laughs> speaking English that time. <coughs> so, my name is Mark Kinsley. I, uh, and, and like Sam, I, you know, kind of have a, a couple of different hats and have some different feelings around this. And I, um, so I'm in, I guess, semi-long-term recovery. Um, I'm someone who Real briefly, started um, <laughs> injecting uh, heroin in 1978, used until about 1990, got clean, um, and then uh, went on a about a 12-year um, run in recovery, and life got really good, and then ended up picking up again, and um, went on a 12-year run that wasn't so good. and. Um, and then ended up in Austin, Texas. Wasn't on the bucket list, but it sure enough saved my ass. Um, am I allowed to swear, Jason? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <clears throat> so, I mean, the reason that I kind of I started with that is that, uh, you know, and let's one of the people talk, but one of the things that was critical in the course of um, my early using um, was in fact, even though at the time I wasn't obtaining medication-assisted therapy through a physician, it certainly was available to me when I didn't feel like doing what I needed to do to hustle on the street to stay well enough to function in life, right? And, um, and then when I relapsed in, uh, in the early 2000s and found myself in the grip of addiction again, um, I will tell you that one of the things that absolutely saved my life was medication assisted therapy, right? And, uh, and so I have, over the last 25 years, worked in communities where very active drug use is, is prevalent, where we come from, where Kenny comes from, where I come from, and, and, and so <coughs> I've always done my work professionally with people that are actively using. And like Sam was speaking of earlier, um, I've seen people's lives transformed as a result of having this medication available. My life um, probably got extended as a result of having this particular medication, you know, methanol and suboxone in particular. Um, and uh, and it's, when I relapsed in the early 2000s, I did go on a clinic, I was monitored, I did do um, all the regiments um, that were asked of me to um, obtain, you know, the uh, medication that would keep me healthy enough to function. Um, that being said, um, I think that that 11 plus years of being in recovery had given me the opportunity to also build a foundation around some other healthy coping mechanisms for me. and. Uh, and I, you know, during that time, even being on methanol and suboxone, I found myself always wanting to um, get, get off of them. I always felt guilty from the recovery community. I was going to meetings every day. I felt like I did not belong. There was guys in those rooms that stopped hugging me that I used to sponsor because I was on methanol. And, um, you know, and so, and I, you know, I, and I think that I'm, I'm bringing that up because it'll be part of the discussion, obviously, today. But I, I'm here to tell you that I, um, I'm eternally grateful for the opportunity to have these medications available. I'll end with this before I let these folks get going, because I'm sure we'll talk some more. One of the pieces around medication-assisted therapy that I find incredibly important at this point in our society and in the recovery continuum is this is that overdoses are the leading cause of death in this country right now. And I will guarantee you nobody's walking into Northland or 101 or any of them damn meetings dead. And so one of the things that medication-assisted therapies do is dramatically reduce overdoses. Dramatically reduce overdoses. So I think it's important that we keep people alive to hear a message of hope and to hear a message of, you know, that there are certain things that they're able to do. And, um, and so the option around having medication-assisted therapy, lower threshold, easier to get to, easier to access, 
um, with, with fewer, you know, hoops to jump through is, is going to be critically important to how quickly we can see um, the programs that we're involved in grow. And, um, and, I, and I think it's an important thing to say. How can we always say to her, Joseph? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my name is Eliza. Um, I believe in like medication assisted therapy. I've been on Suboxone for 13 months. Um, I like obviously I'm like only 20, so I haven't used for like very long. I started like doing like heroin and opiates when I was about 16 years old. And um, my first rehab I went to um, was the park in Houston, and it was like very like oriented and like you know. No antidepressants really, that kind of followed, but it was like very like nothing, like nothing in your system, you have to be totally sober. Um, everyone there like didn't really take it seriously, like we were all kids kind of, like between the ages of like 12 and like 18, which is like never a good idea <laughs> in my belief. And um, it was like, I don't know, just recovery from like then on just didn't really work for me. I have depression, not from chemically induced in my brain but hormonal because I have PCOS which is like a I don't know how to describe it it's just it causes depression but it's um, really really hard to find like a right balance of medication it's very delicate balance and um, antidepressants don't really work with that and I went to a three-month treatment called the Arbor in um, Georgetown which is very is a very good rehab and um, I've been letting my students over living for about six months, and I did everything I was supposed to be doing. I like talked to a sponsor every day. I went to team meetings every day. I I just did everything I was supposed to do on paper. But when you're really depressed, you can't really focus on anything else, and nothing really else matters. So I just didn't really get what I was supposed to do. My sponsor told me she would drop me if I took it in person. So. I just didn't really know what to do, so I like did everything I could to get out of the sober house, and obviously I kept using because you know that didn't work for me. And um, I started taking Suboxone, and it fixed a lot of things. It fixed a lot of things for me. Um, my drug cravings have completely gone away, and I um, I don't know. I just I can't do drugs even if I wanted to. I can't do heroin. I can't you know. I get sick from it, um, but that's not really like the basis of why Suboxone like had like, like I don't know. I'm a little tired. Sorry. Um, so um, the Suboxone was my last shot, though. Kind of like if I had any other like good option, I wouldn't have wanted to go on Suboxone because, as like he was saying, going to meetings and stuff is hard because no one really. Everyone judges you if you're on like a medication like methadone or suboxone or so on, but it saves lives. And I have I'm only 20 and I have 13 friends that have died from addiction outside of AA, like just people from my high school and people from around my neighborhood and stuff that you know were close and then they close the snake community, and that's a lot of people. And um, it's it kind of is a matter of saving lives. I mean it really like that important to be totally like off of everything or is it important to like live your life and be happy and it's, especially for young people in recovery I think um, it's it's hard to take like a seriously um, at first and it's really hard to like stay in it because like your friends are using around you so I think some of is really good and I don't know that's my opinion about it Kenny, I'm an addict. Thanks for having me out. Really appreciate it. Um, I also do like French fries. Um, you know, um, I'm from the Philadelphia area, and uh, I guess my opiate addiction started when I was probably, you know, 14 years old. I popped pills here and there, you know, and um, I didn't know that that was going to set in motion chaos for the next half of my life. Um, like I said, white hands, purple sets, pop them here and there, and then uh, back in the early, like uh, late 90s, 
got into the Alex Collins, um, Dayton, no brand ones, green guys. And um, I love them, man, once I found out that. But the thing about that is, Alex Collins addiction gets real expensive. So, you know, I got turned up into um, heroin. Like in the beginning, because you know, you could sniff and I was petrified of needles. And then once that, um, once I stuck a needle in my arm, that's when. The medical assistance route, I guess, the medical assisted, you know, treatments. Um, I was on uh, Suboxin back in the early 2000s when it first kind of really came on the scene, I guess you could say. Um, that didn't really work for me too well. Um, it's the best of the bunch, so I guess, kind of. Um, I was on Methadone. I was on Subutex. I was back, there was a guy in Jersey I used to go to. I, um, before like the Vivitrol shots, the opiate blockers, I used to get them surgically implanted into my arms. And um, none of that worked for me. Um, I think they're great tools for the short term. We'll get into that, I guess, in a little bit. Um, didn't fix this. Because at the end of the day, man, I, it was just a symbol. You know, I'm a, I'm a drug addict. I have a drug addict mind. I do drug addict shit. Catch me, I'm sorry. <laughs> Catch me, um, I call myself that as awareness. No, um, uh, you know, um, catching on a bad day, someone smacks me in the mouth. You know, I got five years sober today. I live a good way of living. Um, you know, I never thought that. You know, um, I'm getting engaged. I got you know health insurance. I got a job. <laughs> For me, man, like I, it was great, um, like the in the short terms. But my, like I said, the thinking part was it was I, I never like, and I, I just didn't want to deal with consequences. You know, what I mean, I didn't want to be dope sick. I mean, whoever's been dope sick, I mean, that's awful. Nobody wants to deal with that. But that's the thing. Like, I didn't want to. I don't want to deal with consequences. And I still wanted to, you know, do my thing. I just didn't want to be addicted to opiates. You know, but um. The beauty of the, you know, the fellowship um, really changed my life in a new way of thinking. You know what I mean? And a, a new path. And you know, I'm grateful for that. Um, I'll give you my opinion once he starts this discussion. I'll go over here, Doc. But uh, that's it so far. So let's get this going. <laughs> <laughs> So I want to do this as free form as possible. I want us to make sure that we're respectful of everybody and everybody's opinion, and your experiences are going to be different than others. But I do want to throw this out to you. What are your thoughts on medication-assisted therapy? Um, primarily, those people in recovery or people that are around recovery? Or... Is this on? Oh. Mike's closer to the speakers. Can't hear me? No. Really? <laughs> Where's the <laughs> bit? Get a hearing aid with that AARP card. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I commend you. At first, I used to believe in uh, medication assisted uh, therapy because I came up to AA, but since I've been working in the treatment center, it helps. It, Whatever works for you, that's that's good. You know, whatever keeps you sober, whatever's gonna keep you know, uh, uh, make you change and make you have a better life. You know, that's good. Until I got educated, I just didn't believe in it. But it, it helps today. It truly helps today. So I had to get open-minded, and uh, I think it's a great avenue toward recovery.
I mean, I don't see anything wrong with it. I don't see why people would have a negative view on that either way. I mean, it's just everybody's an individual. I can understand how some individuals who don't believe in medication-assisted therapy can look down on it to a certain extent. But, I mean, it's every, like you said, everybody has to be respectful of everybody else's feelings and how they, how they see their recovery and how they're going to enter their recovery. So, um, I had a long-time friend that, uh, actually, he's the one that called the, the paramedics that, that saved my life uh, when I lived in, in Dallas, my first uh, suicide and overdose attempt, and ended up sponsoring him in his, um, in his recovery. And one of the things that he was living with was uh, chronic pain. He had um, slip discs in his back and arthritis in his hands. And a pianist. And if you know anything about musicians, you got to sit there and you got to play. So two areas that um, really held him back from doing his passion and living, living his his passion. Uh, popping pills and then buying pills um, from the local street pharmacist, and and um, you know starting this process of you know how he was going to address his chronic pain. Uh, as well as, you know, uh, address his recovery. So when he got uh, introduced to Suboxone, it was like day and night. He wasn't nodding out, uh, he wasn't feeling the pain, he didn't take, you know, 30 minutes just to get out of bed. Um, and, you know, we saw a huge, a huge uh, difference. And so he would go to 12-step meetings and he would have to not disclose that he was on medication because of, you know, that, that rep that, you know, medication-assisted uh, recovery he has. And so he had to, you know, be in rooms and share partially about his recovery and his recovery experience. And this culture that we try to bring that, you know, that, you know, especially 12-step uh, culture has to really welcome individuals, you know, he felt like an outsider in that. Um, so he had to deal with a lot of, a lot of that stigma, a lot of that shame, a lot of that guilt, and, and you know, not find um, his tribe, so to speak. So I, I'm, I'm, I advocate for medicated assisted recovery. You know, um, I'm a huge uh, believer that you know, when done appropriately with appropriate support, that that you know works for a lot of individuals. You know, especially living with chronic pain. And so you know, as a member. Of a 12-step uh, fellowship, it's really hard to, you know, um, you know, talk to my peers and say, hey, well, you know, give this guy some slack, or, you know, why don't you welcome them the same way, why don't you give them the hug, right, Mark, you know, and, instead of ostracizing them and, and shaming and guilting. So it's, it's you know, it's kind of, uh, we're, we're taught to practice these principles in all our affairs, unless you're on medication. Thank you so much for being on this panel and putting this together. I appreciate y'all sharing. Um, so I just had a quick question. Um, I know that, or I, I understand that uh, maybe 20 years ago, uh, maybe 30 years ago, uh, psychiatric medications of various kinds, including SSRIs, had this same really strong stigma that you're not really sober if you're on antidepressants. Well, you're not really sober if you have to be medicated for your extreme anxiety or something like that, or, or let alone you know, for schizophrenia or something really severe. Uh, that, by and large, seems to have gone by the wayside. I understand that in certain communities um, it, is, it is still very much uh, stigmatized, but at least here in Austin, anecdotally, from my own experience, it doesn't seem to be stigmatized. Do you see uh, medication-assisted therapy as something that could potentially also, you know, be as accepted as, as psychiatric medication in AA communities or 12-step communities? Or do you think that, the, that there's a fundamental difference uh, between psychiatric meds and MAT? 
I, I think it's a great question. Um, so our hope is obviously that it gets um, to that place where people are more accepting of it. I will tell you, you know, Joseph was talking about the spiritual principles, honesty, open-mindedness, and willingness, right? My experience in the rooms is that we're some of the most closed-minded people I know, right? <laughs> and so, and I say that for a couple of reasons. I say that because when educations around uh, SSRIs and other psychotropic medications were really being dealt with in the rooms back in the 80s and 90s and stuff like that, there was an educational push that went on. For whatever reason around medication-assisted therapy, there has been a real walk with people. Not, it's amazing to me how quickly people get sober and become doctors. <laughs> it is fascinating, right? And so, yes, the hope is certainly, right, that it's moving in that direction here, but the, the reality of it is, is that I do think there is a different um, stigma attached to medication-assisted therapy that's not so much attached to um, even psychotropics. Um, so, you know, I hope it moves in that direction. I think we need to continue to educate people and stand up for folks um, when this issue comes up. What do you think that difference boils down to if you can't point to anything? I think, I think there's a long, long, long history of really bad misinformation. Mm -hmm. when, when things like that are said around, you're just substituting one drug for another, and then it's left at that. And, and when we do things like, you can't take a service commitment if you're on medication assisted. You know, we have built-in barriers around this, and, and I'm not sure that was quite the case with some of the other um, medications. I could be wrong. People go to rehab for methadone addictions, and people go to rehab for even suboxone addictions at times. So I don't, I, I mean, but I hope that like people can understand, just like some people have really high anxiety and they need to take like Xanax, not because they need to get high, but because they're going to have an anxiety attack if they don't take it. So I just believe that like it won't. I, don't, I think it'll be hard because a lot of people are really close-minded in the AA and more stuff programs. In my opinion. And my question is, um, first of all, I want to commend you because you're speaking out about your own recovery and your own strategies for recovery, and that shows a lot of responsibility and commitment to yourself, and that's really important, whatever strategies work for you. <coughs> my question is more because I get clients quite often who are on medications, and they don't want to be on them, not that they, you know, They've had a positive experience with them, perhaps, but they are ready to stop. And some of these, uh, like Suboxone, I had a client who was, you know, gradually, gradually, gradually getting off of it, but it was ex an excruciating process to get off of that drug for her and for many people. Aside from that, you know, there are strategies for getting off of anything you want to get off of, thank God. <clears throat> My interest is more the brain chemistry of addiction and what happens to the chemical levels in the brain that feed the addiction cycle. And when do we and how do we get to treating the brain and helping the brain get restored to produce these chemicals on its own? Because beyond strategies for getting sober, there's long-term healing that needs to happen in the brain. Personally, I'm very interested in some of the new kind of, kind of cutting edge things that are going on where people are giving amino acid and nutritional IVs that are showing experientially at least, anecdotally at least, that it's restoring the chemistry in the, in the brain itself so the brain can now produce the right chemicals that it wasn't producing before. So at some point there's got to be this bridge between medication helped me get sober and now I somehow do something to help my brain start functioning correctly. So how do we, you know, like when does that happen? 
uh, that's really kind of my question. Just an open discussion question. That was a great question. So, my uncomfortability with medication assisted therapy is exactly what you just described. We can't. Kind of, has a place, but. So do I. Yeah. has a place and it's really critical and I don't want to take away from that experience. But the brain has the capacity and the capability to heal and to restore its own chemical balance. Um, however, it can't do that until it's, you know, given what it needs to do that. So these um, substitute coping mechanisms, coping medications, are not really restoring brain chemistry. So we have, we have to do multiple interventions, you know, we have to look at nutrition and amino acid profiles and nutritional profiles and, you know, getting more toward helping the brain do its, do what it's naturally meant to do. that makes a difference. And to me, uh, medication-assisted 
treatment to medication assisted recovery is parallel. And maybe it's different, maybe you know, you all as, as my allies and educators can inform me how it's different. I can see the difference. I see more parallels than difference in that particular process. When you when you need don't have enough insulin, your insulin doesn't operate right. And you take insulin, it straightens out. When your brain isn't producing dopamine correctly, it's not producing serotonin correctly. It's not producing sufficient amounts of natural brain chemistry that will make you mentally uh, normal or whatever normal natural. Let's call it that. Then why we have to address that? So giving a drug that fits to the addictive brain's pattern and helps people cope with that is great, but at the end of the day, we may have to give something that actually helps the brain recover and start to produce those chemicals in order to turn it to be comparable to diabetes. Right. Or I think you have to do the things that are the kinds of peer recovery supports that encourage people to um, make some of the lifestyle changes, some of the thinking changes that, that you're talking about. Which to me again is parallel. What are the healthy things then, now that I'm stabilized, what are the other healthy things that I can do to continue to uh, change my life? That, that, that's my outsider's view. We have a lot of hands coming up. I'm going to try to get you all. Uh, but I, I think the, maybe the question in there is so what's the difference between medication assisted treatment and medication assisted recovery? For, for, the, for the panel, that which are, are for, for me, the experts here, what was it like moving from being just on, on treatment uh, into recovery? Um, I think, though, like, also, I wasn't going to get my brain enough time to, like, heal itself. Like, I was either going to, like, kill myself or keep using. I was not going to give myself time. So, taking some awesome is, like, the only option I really had. Because I was going to be the same Children, some of jobs, and some of them who are being very productive. 
some situations not others. We've got to understand that there are spectrums of recovery and it's different for different people. And the one other thing I want to throw out, Sam knows much more about this than I do, um, is that other countries do it with their That there are attitudes in other um, parts of the world that are diametrically opposed to where we are in America, and there are places where people go without judgment and are administered their, their medication in a safe place. Uh, the dosage is protected, but it's not sitting packaging along the back of their lives. So I'm curious if you would say something also about the cultural line. I mean, I can address some of that piece there. And I, and I think it's important, that, you know, so I, the stomach started going. So we're talking about one piece of this disorder, right? And that's the physical aspect of this, right? So when we talk about what does that mean? The definition is different for everybody. You know, my favorite definition is all over the Chicago stuff, and it follows the change, right? right? And so even the answer to total and all the areas of the world, what does this look like in regards to the medicine and the system? Maybe it's just how we do meditation, this is therapy, it's country, it's just crazy, right? So when we ask people up like that with a disorder, right? We may have a pee in a cup in order to give a meditation. No other illness has that happen. None. So for a further stigmatizing people in regards to doing that. And in all respect, my name is called the one here. If I have one more person to tell me that's a man up, I'm going to get sick. Here's the deal. I want it to stop. I can do it. Okay? And I can it, right? Like, at some, some point, point, you're going to be able to be the civic to man. And here are people who so are away with that we use them on the civic to it's critical. It's critical. But, and I'm sure you can start to talk about the value that we're talking about here a little bit. But, but, but the value of this, we're talking about one piece of it here, folks. If we don't have a clear stuff, she talked about the brain becoming kind of healthier, even on the topic of proven that. We also know that the brain becomes healthier on that topic. Proven to that, right? It's right. huge science. There's, There's no medication that's ever been used like that. Ever. And, and so, so, we need to open our eyes up about a lot of things, but we need to have people be comfortable enough to have recovery period of homage to come to the field of individuals around a medication resistant to recovery. I like that, you know, because, man, I don't know what someone else is recovering, but it's like, you know, my man, this is a man. Most of them are asking, you know? <laughs> and so, you know, I don't know, man. I tell you sometimes, I get in and 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 I get Thank you for that last remark. I, you know, I think one of the big myths is that medication-assisted recovery does not equal abstinence. And it's called medication-assisted recovery. It's medicine. It's not taking drugs. And now that's not to say that some people don't do that the right way. And I think the best practice is if you're taking medication, you do have some kind, some kind of recovery program or place to do your recovery work. That it's not just medication, but it's medication and some other form of recovery work. All right? Now, traditionally, folks on medication have been shunned from 12-step communities in very hostile ways. They've been told outright that you are not welcome here, that you are using substances that we don't want you here. People have told us this time and time again. And that, there's no place for that. And, our, founder, founder, and our founders did not tell us that. that you're absolutely right. That, that's, that's, that's against the traditions. So, 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 so we've got that to deal with. You know, we've got our own bigotry to deal with. And our own lack of understanding and lack of education. And I've been on an education curve for about 15 years, mostly being taught by people using medication-assisted recovery. And some folks have been doing it for short term and taper off, and some folks have been doing it for 30 years and probably never will taper off. And you know what? None of my business. One of the things is one of the defining aspects of recovery is we get to define our own recovery. And I, I and so we don't also in that same. 
saying, well, don't, don't judge others, others for the way that they define their problem. So are, are we going to create a big tank where everyone's included, where, where we really do practice all pathways to recovery? Because we talk that talk. Are we going to walk it? And so I think these are really important discussions to have because everybody has their own feelings, and some of them are not based on facts. And so part of it is you know, bringing more people that are on using medication to assist their recovery to open up this dialogue so that we can get to know one another and figure out how this works together. So you know, I, I think we're always on an evolution learning curve with this, and we've come a long way. But folks, we have a long way to go. And, and I had to get past my own, my own attitudes and thoughts about what recovery was. And it's a slow process, but it works. So thanks a lot. Thanks, Tom. Um, so you know. Thank you all so much for you know standing up there, or sitting up there, and, and telling your stories. It takes a, you know a lot of strong, uh, strong effort to be able to do that, and, and I'm really looking to you all for, for being willing to share that with us. Um, so, so coming from, from a very, very strong traditional 12 step background, I was raised in. Um, I too like Tom. You know, I, it's taking a long time to come into this understanding, and, and there are many pathways to this to this still called recovery. And my pathway is my pathway. Everybody else's pathway is their pathway. Um, I think in conversations we need to start having, in my personal opinion, is not whether or not medication assisted recovery is acceptable, but when it is used, how can I best support those people who are using that type of recovery? Did it make me choose that path? So, you know, regardless of what, I, you know, what, my, what, what works for me, because medication assisted recovery would not be something that would work for me personally. But regardless of that, where I am today is I love my brothers and sisters in recovery regardless. You know, and I want to be willing to coach them and help them in life. What, what, what can I do to get you to a place that you want to be? If you, if you choose to use medication assisted therapy for the, you know, 13, 14, 30 years, then so be it. How can I continue to support you in doing that? If you lie as a if you were happy, if you were, if you were sane, if you were holding a job, if you were enjoying life, just what what country is all about, if you're living, if you're living, how can I support you? You know, regardless of what my personal opinion is, what I would do, I'm not this as a person. And it's taking a long time to get to that place, but I think that's a conversation that really needs to be happening. Not whether or not it's okay or not, but whether or not I'm willing to support others that choose that pathway, you know? So what are uh, what are the, what are those uh, supports that individual need? I mean, let's let's name them. You know, so if, if somebody uh, chooses medication assisted treatment, what, what other types, types of support do they need? Uh, well, I, you know, I think one of the things, Jason, um, I think it's important that man, you know, there's people that will not sponsor individuals that are medication assisted recovery and because they don't know about it. I think we need to open that up for a greater dialogue. I think the recovery coaching and the, you know, the whole community needs to be more open and embracing around this issue, right? I, you know, this is a topic you and I have discussed before. There needs to be medication-assisted treatment recovery homes. I mean, where do folks go with that? Like, you know, I mean, there needs to be all these things that everybody else has access to as well. I just wanted to comment that if you look at the physiology, the science, the science behind addiction right now is where the science behind mental health was 30 years ago. Uh, medication you, you didn't have 30 years ago, you were talking about Thorazine and Halidol as being the antipsychotics. Those were what's going to help people. It doesn't matter what helps you. Science itself will graduate. Uh, when you're trying to make that comparison to substance abuse and mental health, and you're talking about not, you know, some individuals, people shouldn't do this, people shouldn't do that, because we're going to normalize like the enemy did. You have to remember that some people, there's a genetic predisposition for the brain not to be, that I'm closer to within the normal. I can say normal because who's to describe, who's to define normal? You know, your brain doesn't work within those norms. So, Who's to say until the science advances to the point where they're able to actually diagnose to the extent that they go to mental health and provide medication that is specific to that diagnosis? And I'm not talking about just the medical, uh, medical aspect of the physiology, the psychiatric, the psychiatric, I hate my the psychiatric aspect of it. It's, it's 
tradition is a sentence right now. So for a foster person to feel that they need, a, a person that whenever they need to take the feel that their recovery is working for them, I think that's something that should be left up to the individual. I don't know how much sense that made, I study too much. <laughs> This is what I want to ask you. Uh, it's, it's like this. We, we know that it, it's different for everybody that's in recovery. Okay, I, I also want to see anybody, you know, uh, say, I, I take funding for high blood pressure. They give funding for everyone that's withdrawn in some places. So, you know, when I go to a it says the only requirement for a membership is that I start drinking. It don't say anything about it. You know, if you're on medication, and we have to have the wisdom to know the difference and be educated. You know, I'm also a person in long term, uh, you know, I have 15 years, uh, plus I'm a minister. So if I uh, work with my peers and say, okay, the only way you're going to get sold is that you got to go to the church. So I have to be open minded to know that there's many pathways to recovery. And I think that's what we're missing. There's many pathways to recovery. And we have to work with our, our peers and daughters to what they're doing, we have to meet them where they are. If not, uh, we're going to lose them. And we have to educate people. Don't you think we have to educate people as to you know, what it is to be uh, on medication and recovery and move toward recovery? We, we talk about treatment, but we have to talk about uh, going toward recovery, which is going to help our people. I'm Steve Lee, and uh, yeah, I, I, I'm with Sam that the, the conversation is, is terribly uncomfortable because it's so challenging to, uh, 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 to a long-standing paradigm and, and one that has served me so well, and, and it's uncomfortable to get out of the bubble. And uh, one of the very, I think uh, uh, when I got to Alcoholics Anonymous uh, over 26 years ago, one of the simplest instructions to understand was that 100% abstinence was, was how we measured our time, calendar time. And it wasn't always easy to execute, but it was easy to understand. And, and this is a very nuanced and layered discussion that we're having here today. And, uh, uh, and, and the panel, I mean, I have great respect for each individual's experience, honor it, and believe it. I don't, certainly don't challenge it. So the question is not, uh, uh, and, by the way, I've seen people prayed over and they got sober. It just didn't work for me. But, uh, uh, but, but, but see, when something's working, it, it, if you can't get out of the office and then turn three and three and four, or start screwing with a swing, don't tell me I'm gripping it wrong. Let me go play. And if I can take it in my recovery and get it, as this gentleman said, said in my mind, if the life that I'm getting, if I can return to the mainstream of life as a result of the
that the hotel was retreating. Just because the hotel was retreating provides that they weren't providing medically assisted treatment. I would hate to see the deflators and options dry up completely so people can find the way it's treating. And so I'm not getting a lot of pain with the broad brush on my side of the equation and have enough layers that people can find their way. Uh, I think those are multiple pathways that provide a different challenge to their people. Multiple pathways, but they're not always comfortable sitting around and saying, hey, that's a challenge. It's, uh, it, 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 you can't always cope with this. I would never, I would never, it breaks my heart to think that someone didn't get a hug. You should always get a hug, but you don't always agree with what happens after the hug. You, you don't know the noise necessarily have to share that same philosophical, clinical, or spiritual approach that that provides those all the pathways. But uh, I think perhaps the uh, uh, intro, uh, 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 maybe put on the like myself, the uh, most, uh, uh, the, 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 the one line in the big book that is almost that is we pay attention to is we realize we don't only live.
succeed uh, without, you know, I am ADD. When they say that one third of, of ADD children carry them in their adult, I think I did. Pretty sure, according to my mother, my friends, everybody else, you know, those people in my life. And uh, I found something that works for me when taken, you know, I have no interest in abusing something that works for me. And, and I find this fascinating because it's like, wait a minute, if I had a heart condition or something, oh my God, everybody, make sure you line up and take your pills and breakfast, but if it's a psychiatric issue, you better get off that. Well, what is it, a bicycle? Get off that. You know, and I find the question, of, I found a balance in my life that works, and I don't know, when, I, when you guys up there, you got a balance in your life that works, that's what matters, you know, that's what matters.
dry sockets in a surgery where I had to take opiates and people were like, you need to change your sobriety date. You know, and um, I think it's I think it's terrible when people come in and they're on Suboxone and methadone and they're, and they're there at a friggin' meeting. They could be out trying to go do something else and people are like that. My, my thing is, I had to, when, when I say man up, I had to because like I tried that route and it didn't work for me. I've never seen someone, I spoke to her, I've never seen somebody do it appropriately like she's doing. I've never seen somebody go, hey, I'm going to all my meetings, I'm, I'm, I'm taking Suboxone as prescribed, I'm going to my methadone clinic as prescribed. I just know from my own experience, all the people, when, when, when I was back home and I was on the clinic and I was in the spots and doctors and stuff like that, no one was taking it as prescribed. My question to all the other people is, how long are we supposed to keep somebody on it, right? Do we ever take the training wheels off? Do we lean them down? Like old boy said up there, he said something about, you know, said about uh, having separate um, recovery homes for people that are on, you know, places like that. Because, I mean, if I was on methadone and I was in a, because I went through recovery homes and I thought that was fantastic. I mean, if I was in a recovery home where people were on methadone and I was on methadone, I could vibe with that person because we're going through the same things so and we can share our experience. But the peer support thing, I think it's fantastic too, man, because, you know, besides 12 steps, like, you, you need some you know, some support systems and stuff out there, you know. I, the reason I, I, I love the 12 step uh, program, it's not for all the, all that, you know, the fanatics and all that. I like the fellowship aspect of it because, like, when I went through a lot of traumatic stuff in recovery, you know what I mean? Um, the fellowship was there for me, you know, the people in the, in the fellowship love them and stuff like that. You know, because I had have a toy to see, man. I, you know, I went through interferon, so got through it, you know, and they, they were all from remedication and stuff, and, you know, I didn't take it because I feel like, you know, that would defeat the whole purpose of me, you know what I mean? And, like, um, it's just, I don't know. I don't, want to, I don't want to come off as like a fanatic because I, I'm not. Anyone that knows me and goes to me and me, I'm that guy that's like, oh, here we go, here's this jerk off again on this fucking soapbox. You know what I mean? Because I'm, like, I'm not that guy. You know? And, uh, you know, I just wanted to, I, like, if, if something's done appropriately and, and, and it's being monitored, why, why, why can't it not work with the recovery thing? But, like, when do we take somebody off? When do we clean them down? When do we take the training wheels off and see if maybe they can do it? Because, you know, they could possibly could, you know what I mean? So, yeah. It was a good question. It's a really good question. So Jason let me know that they're kicking us out. We're supposed to be kicked out of much better places. And much worse. Um, I wanted to thank you guys. Um, that was OK. I think in my recovery, I need to have uncomfortable conversations with people, and I need to be transparent. And thank you for being transparent, and thank you for having an uncomfortable conversation. Um, I made the realization that I'm terrified of the patient assistant there. I'm not really sure why, but I am. Um, and I think that my sponsor was asking, am I moving in love or am I moving in fear? And the same thing is moving in love. So, with that, I'll, I'll end this and thank you guys again. Thank you, everybody. And uh, we'll see you at the ET School of Social Work for day two. Woo! Today is Mark's birthday. Would you guys join me in the same